So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, the talk uh, will be about WSL2, so Windows Subsystem for Linux version 2, uh, and how Windows developers actually can use it as a developer tool. Uh, to be totally sincere, this um, presentation I have, let's say, adapted a little bit for the code mentor um, uh, webinar because the original talk was more around cloud native. So around Docker, around Kubernetes and other projects like that, that one. So whenever I will say by reflex cloud native, try to transpose or translate to your own, let's say, uh, ecosystem. What are you doing? Is it embedded? Is it uh, development? Is it uh, corporate development? Is it BI? Is it other things, right? So hopefully I will show some use cases today, uh, some demos. Uh, it's quite basic. So for anyone who already knows about WSL might be like repeating a little bit, but for the others, well, welcome. That's the, the public eye I like. So without further ado, uh, the agenda quickly, uh, who am I? Uh, why do I talk about it? Um, and then we deep dive a little bit. As I said, uh, cloud native is in parentheses here because that's my point of view. Uh, but anyway, some projects uh, from a Windows perspective, um, then how will WSL2 help? And some couple use cases, it's more like for references to know that WSL reached the, the point where it is actually useful in production. Uh, lots of demos, hopefully, uh, even though we are late, and then uh, some references for you to keep on learning. I will give my slides to the code mentor uh, folks. So uh, afterwards, you can just uh, potentially be able to to download the, the slides. And if not, let me know on Twitter or uh, on Twitter, <laughs> where, uh, where I can uh, send it them to you. Okay, so next. So who am I? Uh, my name is Nuno do Carmo. Uh, I'm actually split in two person. So let's start by the daytime. I'm a tech writer at Suze Rancher. Uh, I'm Portuguese. I'm living in Switzerland since ages, so I'm more Swiss than Portuguese, but still don't have the, the passport. Um, I love cinema, anime, martial arts. Uh, I'm the proud owner of four cats. Uh, that's my wife's kite, but yeah, that's my cats. And then some recognitions. I won't go through them too much, but the, the point here that you should, uh, let's say, remember, it's like I'm a Microsoft MVP on development. Um, then during nighttime, uh, I'm the WSL Corsair. Uh, I love and I'm passionate about uh, Microsoft, Docker, and Cloud Native really much. Uh, you can find me exclusively almost on Nunix Tech on Twitter. Uh, and then um, what I do is blogging, adding distros. We will potentially add one today. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And then finally, the hat you can see on the picture is my hat given to me by Brian Cattleson uh, from now AWS. He was at Microsoft before, but he's like a, a goal master. So a really dear friend. Then let's cut the chase and go into what it's important here. So what is WSL2? So I, I will try to monitor uh, the chats as much as I can. Um, but let me know in the chat and I will uh, maybe even read and uh, get it to later. Uh, if you knew about WSL2 already, and if you use it already, okay? Um, for the ones who doesn't, uh, so WSL2 was created circa, or not WSL2, sorry, WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, first version was uh, created circa 2016. Um, and uh, it was a 
what we call a compatibility or translation layer that could help us, the users, to run actual Linux commands and binaries on top of Windows. So why translation now? Because WSL1 is actually sitting on top of your Windows normally without any visualization needed. But every time that we needed to, let's say, uh, call a program, call a, a command like cat, right, to read some files, then these will need to be translated from the Linux command to the Linux, let's say, uh, kernel, which is a, a syscall, let's say, a system call. So, and then this syscall was translated into the Windows kernel. Okay, so there's a translation. It went well. Let's say the, the majority of the commands are there still today. So Microsoft still develops it. But of course, when you speak about translation, there's parts that you might and cannot actually translate. Some really deep kernel features or even the way like Linux works with sockets, for example, and files, and that Windows doesn't work like that. So they reached the point where WSL1 was good enough to run like a, what we call the user land, the user space of a Linux independently, let's say Ubuntu for now, but uh, you could run uh, Ubuntu. But then you could not run all Ubuntu. You could run the majority of it, but not all. So after two years in 2018, what Microsoft did is that they were actually building what we call the Linux containers on Windows, LCAL, uh, which is kind of working somewhere still, but uh, not so much present. But the technology behind was that they will create a, a sort of micro VM on top of Hyper-V virtualization. Okay, so here on the top right, uh, you can see, for example, uh, the architecture, okay? Uh, props to Thomas Maurer, who did it. Um, so WSL2 here, you have a, like a comparison. And for example, what, what WSL1 cannot do is, okay, it's not a managed VM, like I said, but then there's no full Linux kernel, which a visualization, right? If you use Hyper-V, if you use VirtualBox, VMware, name it, then you can run an OS, an operating system, on top of it fully. With WSL1, you couldn't. With WSL2, you can, OK? Thanks to this micro VM. Uh, then it means that all the system calls were compatible, OK? So it's like, really, you create a, a virtual machine of uh, an Ubuntu on top of your Mac or your Windows. Then here we go. You have really the same behavior, OK? Or the same compatibility. There's still some points to address, but let's say the majority now it's fully compatible. And the performance, however, is on the file system. And I did a small check uh, and test. You will see I put them on the slides. Uh, that is very funny. Is that actually WSL1, because it's sitting on top of the NTFS uh, file system, so your Windows file system, C, uh, colons, uh, backslash, so on then the performance are way uh, better than actually WSL2, OK? Because the thing, or not way better, but they are better. Uh, because actually, it, there's no translation really on, on top of it. So you don't have to go into a, a VM, do some magic to have uh, the files communicating and getting to write them. So here, the performance are still on the WSL1 slide, side, uh, but then WSL2 is really reaching up a lot. And here, just a small joke like our friends on the Linux space did. Love it. So, OK. So why are we here? OK, as a Windows user mainly, and potentially you too, uh, when you go, let's say, at work or 
on a conference, you see a cool demo by someone. You discover a new project or tool, and you're like, oh, wow, I want to test it. In cloud native, it's like Kubernetes, other. OK. So uh, you can read the blog that came from this demo, right? And then the first questions that we have is that, does it run on Windows? Are there any examples uh, for PowerShell? And that's mainly on cloud native, potentially. It's not the case, <laughs> unfortunately. So we end up in a trick or treat state where, OK, um, projects from the Windows uh, point of view, especially in cloud native space, it's always kind of like really these, uh, OK, will I, will I be able to run it or not? All right. So typically, that's what I was saying. Like, here is a, a Kubernetes. So for the ones who know it, it's, uh, let's say, the lead project on the cloud native space. Uh, it's in a container orchestrator. And um, everyone nowadays kind of use it or heard about it. Still, for us Windows persons, um, if we want to use like just the client of Kubernetes named kubectl, uh, this one, you go there and when you go into the docs, well, it's, it's really tiny, but what you will see here is that it's really commands from a Linux perspective, so bash or CSH. And then if we search a little bit into the documentation, we can see that we can actually install it on Windows. So there's like a, a Windows binary for us to, to be used, which is great. So first you see like there's a curl command. So you know that it's already PowerShell, it's not CMD. It, that's the curl uh, alias. So this command here might not work. So you need to use the curl.exe because that's even another program. And so you go through, so already you see like you have a lot of translations here to, to be done. Um, then you go into like, you install it, you're happy, but what about like potential uh, optional configurations that I would like to do, right? So you go there and you see that, okay, I can have kubectl completion, auto-completion. And the problem is that this auto-completion is not working because here you can see there's bash, bash on macOS, bash on Linux, and ZSH. Then the power, however, of us being part of a community like the cloud native or your respective communities, name it maybe Java or other development. What you can do is like, you can go into the project and ask, open a case, GitHub, GitLab, Gitbucket, whatever. You can go there and then you can open an issue and ask for help. Since then, so this picture is not up to date because since then the kubectl PowerShell has been actually finally merged so it has been implemented and this means that after a few years but still this means that we have a voice into these open source communities okay so uh rajesh what i will do is like if you can type your question i will take it or else i will just uh go at, at the end because we kind of lost uh potentially a lot of time very funny um, so how does WSL2 help? When you go into this blog reading, right? Then you will have this um, learning capability that if you have WSL2, you can simply take the, um, the blog and adapt it, okay? You can just simply go through your blog 
do the copy pass into your WSL2 uh, instance. So you have what I call the unchanged blog reading uh, capability. Then WSL2, if you are, let's say, interested in learning some Linux commands, for example, you might want or need, let's say, to, to install it first into a virtual machine or try to uh, boot it up in like an old, um, let's say, computer that you might have. So this one will be kind of difficult, okay? So WSL2, because it's really, let's say, very easy to install, and we'll see that after during the demos, because we have that, then you will be able to actually have a first easy contact with Linux, simply with the command lines, okay? Then in practice, we do have actually the unmodified Linux binaries, which is great. And then we can use Linux as it is, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, name it. Okay. Finally, on the technical aspect, like I said, there is no VM setup. So it's way less overhead. It's like what I call micro VMs, really. And then we can leverage the, U the Windows binaries really to expand the, the, the experience of WSL2 on Windows. Okay. So from the 90s or early uh, 2000, we went from uh, Linux versus Windows kind of fighting to now Microsoft loves Linux. I'm not sure if it's the other way around, but Microsoft loves Linux. So let's say that respects now is, uh, is what we have between the two. Okay. So, like I said, now in terms of, let's say, development, what do we have as uh, experiences and a return after, like, say, six years now that WSL1 exists, four years that WSL2 exists, what can we actually use now? And what we can do is, like, as a data scientist, for example, your first wish is potentially to have a company, uh, sorry, a computer that might run uh, the workloads that you want to throw at them. Okay, one of them, one of these computers is done by HP. So if you look now at the Z series of HP, actually there's quite a lot of, um, let's say information. And one of them is how to, how HP did embed or pre-install actually WSL2 directly on, um, on the, on the OS that they, they provide, which is Windows in this case. So as a data scientist now, you don't have to bother anymore about like, okay, what is WSL? How do I install it? Uh, what can I do? No, you don't have all that. You can simply come and have your machine ordered, delivered, and already, um, let's say, ready for you to use. The second one, was a bit more like uh, interesting. As a developer in big companies, WSL2 is already being used. And one of the most interesting case was actually from Blizzard themselves uh, that are debugging uh, Diablo 4 uh, with WSL2. So, it's quite interesting to see like a company like Blizzard and others actually, not only on the gaming industry, but to found, they found like a way to have their Windows workshop, uh, workstations and be able actually to leverage it. So the first demo, I will not do it. And then we will jump into, um, uh, let's do and jump into uh, the VM and do some nice demos. 
So the first one is like the old way, how to get WSL. So we need to start somewhere, right? The somewhere is like how to install it. So if we go first into the BIOS is we need to install the virtual or enable, not install, enable the virtualization technology. Remember WSL2 is a micro VM that sits on top of the, um, the Hyper-V virtualization stack, okay? So we need our computers or our CPUs, AMD, Intel, uh, ARM uh, for that matter, uh, to have actually the visualization enabled. Once our computer has that part enabled, then here you can see that we will need two items or two features from Windows to be able to run WSL2. One is the virtual machine platform and the other is the WSL itself, okay? As you might know with Windows is always the same. So it means that once you installed it, then you have to reboot. Once you rebooted, then you, in the past or in Windows 10, you will need to install actually WSL, the binaries kind of, if you want, uh, into it. And then finally, you will add your distro of choice, like Linux distribution, and to finally uh, set it uh, and be able to run it, okay? So that was the way when it started WSL2 again, circa 2018, 2019, that's how they started um, doing it. So then, since then, so we still need the virtualization, so that's out of the way. But then now we have other ways of doing it. So let me switch here. So WSL is currently already installed, right? But I will like uh, show you uh, how it was. So first, now what you can do, you can list and there's a online feature that will tell you like, if you run this command, WSL.exe, dash dash install, and then a distribution of your choice that is here, can be Oracle Linux, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Kali, and Debian, okay? That are the default. They are not the only ones that exist, but that the only ones that are available to install the first time, let's say. So by running WSL dash dash install, and then the distro of your choice, what it will do is that it will emulate all the checks that uh, we saw uh, just before, right? And it will actually install directly all the components. It will ask you to reboot because again, we are enabling uh, some features uh, on the kernel, but then you will be able to simply, once you restart it, you will be able to use it right away. So this is really, really convenient. Because before, as you saw, it was like, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to reboot, you need still to install other things. Now it's a simple command. You go, you type WSL dash dash install. So here in the previous one, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, it will be on the slides anyway. So WSL dash dash install will install the default distribution, which is Ubuntu. And then you can use it directly. Now, how to get WSL2 in Windows 10 21H2, so the latest one, because I don't think 22H1 is still out, so it's 21H2, or um, WSL on Windows 11. You will need to do one thing manual, which is enable the virtual machine and Windows subsystem for Linux. You can do the WSL install, don't get me wrong, right? But here, if you don't want to do that, but you want to install actually the Windows subsystem for Linux from the Windows store, 
and I will explain what are the difference just after. Uh, then you will need just to install these two, install reboot, and then install the WSL from the store. Again, install your preferred um, Linux distribution. And finally, you will be able to use it. OK, so again, if we go here, if you go into the store and you search for Windows subsystem, oops, subsystem, here you can see that in the, in the suggestions, you will have Windows subsystem for Linux. And then instead of open the first time, it will ask you to install it. This store compared to the WSL install that we did is the preferred way. And after some talks with uh, Microsoft and the WSL team, they kind of admitted that it will be the, the way forward right now. Um, this allowed them to not be bound to the Windows um, uh, releases, right? 11 or 10. 22H1, for example, or uh, Windows 11, 22H1 also. And so they don't need anymore to be aligned, to be part of the OS. By being an app that uh, actually it's installed from the store, then WSL now, and WSL2 in this case, has its own uh, life cycle. So they don't, they, they are no more dependent on the Windows team which is, I think, for me, better, but that's not me. So once you have installed WSL, and again, when I will say WSL from now on, especially here, uh, it will always be WSL2. I'm, I have WSL2 in mind, right? But you install uh, WSL. So you have the capabilities to actually do what they call the interoperability between Linux and Windows. The first one is, uh, as we can see here, is that the in your Windows Explorer on the, the quick bar, you will have now a new icon, which is Linux. OK, so again, if I come here, you see here, there's Linux OK, in my quick access. So I have everything here. And then I have a new icon. And if I click on it, I will see, and we'll see just uh, in a few minutes, uh, my distros, OK? And I can directly go inside it. And for example, if I go to my home into the Oracle Linux distribution, I can see all my files here, OK? So that's already like a first uh, way. Of course, from WSL, but uh, sorry, I should have shown it you here. So let me take uh, OpenSUSE, for example. So from here, uh, if I do, if you don't know the, the commands, that's OK. It's, it's just for me to, to show you something. Uh, if I come here and I look at what is mounted, I see that I have a slash mnt slash c file system okay and let me actually go here into my desktop for example and uh, yeah sorry create just a text file okay file from windows and here now i'm on uh, WSL2, right? So if I look at the which OS I have, it's really like OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and everything. So that's good. And now if I do a, a LL, which is a, uh, or LS-L, which is a long list, and I go see the pass, right, on Windows, you will see my file that is that I just created. Okay. So from Windows, I see my file system of Linux into separated into the distributions. 
And from the distribution, I can see the Windows file system. Then there's some networking. I won't enter too much in, into that here. Uh, just one big warning. The networking of WSL2 is for now with the performances of files uh, transfer with Windows. Uh, it's by far the, let's say the least performance and with the most issues actually open. Uh, it works, don't get me wrong. It works perfectly for, let's say the default usage or the main usage, but suddenly when you want to go a little bit more deeper, if you have a VPN, for example, then it can get really complicated really fast. Okay, not impossible, complicated. Um, the commands, so let me actually show you. So the first thing is that here I called uh, write or do I have VI? Yeah, I do have VI. Yeah. Okay, so I have an editor here um, from the Linux side, right? So I could edit the, the file that we just saw before. Okay, file from Windows, blah, blah, blah. Here, echo from um, Linux. Okay, and now if I go here, you can see that it's no more zero, is one kilobyte. So like it's not one kilobyte, but that's the minimal that we can see. And if I open it with notepad, for example, I can see the text that I just typed from um, uh, Linux and WSL. Of course, that's not what I wanted to show is that now, let's say that you don't know VI for good reasons, uh, but you know notepad. So let me close it. And what I can do here, and I press tab, right? I just typed note. And then now you can see that I have this .exe. So remember, I'm fully running on WSL2 Linux, okay? And now if I go again into the, the file, I can open. So I don't have permissions for whatever reason. So might be a bug here, but I can open the file, okay, directly from WSL. Forget the bug here, but it's it's working. All right. So that was here the what uh, the commands that you can leverage, and the applications. I will talk about them just in a few uh, slides uh, in more in depth. So. What I was saying just before, remember I said like there's, uh, when we compare WSL1 to WSL2, there was some performance issues. And here uh, I will just show you uh, one small test, uh, for example. So on WSL, I downloaded the Linux kernel. So there's a lot of files in it, right? So on WSL, I'll downloaded it on the file system of WSL, that's important. So here it's like tilde slash GitHub, for example. And I unzipped this uh, file, which is like five or 10 megabytes, okay? Which full of small files. So one of the worst tests that you can really run, let's say. It took like 28 seconds. It's good, right? However, when you do that, from WSL still, but this time I'm on my pass, my Windows pass, right? Uh, slash MNT slash C and so on. It took me 29 minutes. Actually, I let it run. I, I thought it was like there was a bug or there was whatever, but no, that's how bad the file system performance is between let's say WSL trying to write into the Windows file system. Then, uh, I tried to, again, uh, with another type, okay, uh, to redo this example. And it was like consecutive, like uh, having always the same issues, all right? So this here shows you one thing. If you want to run with WSL2 and you have like uh, projects, right? then please 
stay on WSL2 file system. Don't try to write or add your project on the Windows file system and access it through WSL to make some, let's say, um, manipulations. That won't work, unfortunately. OK. So a few words about this row. I see the time is running. And Ron, I will address you this question and then uh, your question also of the on the um, on the page that you that you put like earlier. Um, so distributions, you can have them in two ways. You can have them through the store. So let's have a look here. So if I type uh, WSL, just WSL, then, uh, OK, I know them, so I can tell you. But we have like the Fedora Remix uh, distribution. Uh, we have Alma Linux. We have Alpine, the, the Ubuntu series. Uh, we have OpenSUSE, of course. Uh, and so on and so forth. So you have quite a lot of, um, let's say, choice, OK, Debian, Oracle, uh, already pre-configured for you in a, in a sense, OK? So when you install uh, a WSL, uh, let me take the Ubuntu preview if I can find it. I will show you. Ubuntu preview. So you search for the app. OK, and here I will just show you on PowerShell. So, oh, the store. OK, I'm on a virtual machine, so getting kind of weird here with nested virtualization. So don't mind too much what's happening here. On your computer, it will work way more easily. Ubuntu preview, please. Thank you. OK, and I will click Install. All right, so here you can see that I don't have any Ubuntu distributions right now, right? So once it will download, so we will switch now to uh, continue, but you will see that actually I will simply click a button and it will install, okay? It will install the distribution for myself with helpers, okay? Like a normal application. Now, if you know Linux a little bit, and especially if you look at the, the picture here on the left, you can see that there's way more distributions than choices in the um, Microsoft Store, right? So what Microsoft did with WSL and WSL2 is that we can do a side loading of our distros. Uh, I will show you in potential. Yeah, I will show you just a little bit after. OK, so here you have a lot of distributions and you can sideload them Okay, inside WSL, which is kind of cool because you can pick your choice. So last year, or even two years ago already, one of the requests from the community was that we wanted some, some way of graphics to be, uh, let's say, to be done automatically out of WSL. Until that point, you could have it. You could have, uh, a, um, let's say, uh, what we call an X server outside running in two uh, windows. And then you could connect. That's how it works. But you could connect a client app from Linux, in, in this case, WSL, to your server, and it will display it. It's still being used. It works really great. There, It's projects that are like 10 to 15 years minimum. So by no means, you can still use them. However, Microsoft did their own, sorry, did their own implementation with WSLG, OK? So why I was waiting is that now I will open this new uh, Ubuntu preview. And 
as you can see here, I have an application that is a Windows application. Okay, you can see here the icon. This will, okay, this will do a lot. It will unpack the distro and blah, blah, blah. Uh, fast forward, let's say, uh, at some point in time, the installer will actually reboot in a sense. And what it will do, which is quite neat in, in, in my eyes, is that it will, oh, here we go, actually. It was faster than I thought. Okay, there's always a lot of uh, issues, but will it launch? Okay, what it will do is like, it will launch now a window from WSL instead, okay? Uh, again, running on the VM might not be the best thing that I've done. Uh, yeah, okay, so it crashed, unfortunately. So let me see if I can go faster if I do uh, sudo zipper x11 apps, I think it is. OK, let's see. We will let it go. And we will try to launch like our own application, uh, visual application. So WSL G for graphics. Uh, OK, so it was not this one. OK, anyway, um, this one is only available on Windows 11. OK, not Windows 10, only on Windows 11. If you are running on Windows 10, for whatever reason, at work, at home, OK, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, like, if you are running it, then you will not have WSLG, OK? Just fast forwarding, um, WSL, uh, I put here the links, but WSL has two main configuration files. One outside your distribution, so a global one, which is the lower one here, actually on the bottom. So it's WSL config. And this one allows you to manipulate to some extent, right? Not too much, but to some extent, you can manipulate the micro VM. You can allow more or less memory, you can allow more or less uh, CPUs, for example, that's the main usage. If you have your own kernel, if you know how to do it, then you can also load it from here and so on and so forth, okay? This WSL config applies to the VM, meaning it will apply, if I do a change in WSL config, it will be applied to everything that is WSL, okay? So all the, uh, all the distros will be impacted by that. Then on the top here, you have the wsl.conf that goes in slash etc. And this one is per distribution. So if you do a change, anything here, it will only impact the distribution that you have this wsl.conf uh, being there, okay? So it's a bit more secure. This one is be careful. You cannot really break it, but you can do some stuff that can, uh, let's say, impact you in your work. And this one is a bit more, let's say, uh, secure to touch and to try out, OK? Oh, I have a, a small wrencher here. Nice. Um, then there's some tooling around WSL, one that is outside, which is called HCES Diag, which is like a, a diagnostic tooling for Hyper-V itself, so you can see everything. But especially Hyper-V, you have another tool called hvc.exe. And this one normally will list the VMs and you can, let's say, interact with them. In this case, it will not be the case. HCS Diag is really a diagnostic tool only. Then on WSL itself, and this one I can show you, everything runs out of the VM. And remember, I did a, a, a long listing here, right? But there's another distro behind the scenes, which is the system distro. And this one actually allow, allows you to do some further debugging at a lower level, OK? at a lower level of uh, uh, on WSL, the VM in itself. 
Okay, so we are on top of, uh, of the uh, hour. Uh, we lost kind of 20 minutes, but I will try to, to wrap up in five. Um, there's uh, another tool. This one, you should pay for it, but uh, it's made by friends and the, it's called Raft. Uh, you can find it on the store and it will allow you actually to manage your distributions and perform some uh, default tasks if you don't know them or if you want to do them, let's say at large, then you can use Raft to do that. Have a look. Uh, I think you have like 14 days uh, free if you want to just have a look without paying. So really nice, uh, recommend definitively. So the apps before, when I was speaking about like uh, what WSL2 and uh, Windows was doing. So we reached a point where not only Microsoft is behind WSL2, but there's really an ecosystem of developer tools now that are using them. And Ron, I'm looking at you right now. <laughs> so uh, the first and the most known one is uh, Visual Studio Code. And this one, as you see here, the small green, there's a plugin, which is the WSL connector. And what it will do is that it will open a, or it will create a server on your distro and WSL, uh, sorry, VS Code will actually connect to your WSL distro. And here you can see, uh, or not, <laughs> the, let's say the, um, the files and directories from Linux directly, okay? So I'm running inside WSL with uh, VS Code as my tool, right? So VS Code is here, right? So I have VS Code here, which is the Windows. Sorry, I really wanted to show you. Uh, let me see if I do something here quickly. Oh, and I cannot type. Okay, forget that. Um, so here, and I did the first run. It's just a small Go program, copy past, uh, which will tell me on which OS I'm running. And you can see that I'm running on Linux because I'm connected to here, to my uh, um, OpenSUSE distribution. So here, if I go to Go Mentor, I can see my file. Yeah, my VM is really crashing, sorry. Okay, here we go. And I have, uh, I have Go, installed here, right? So uh, I think it's go run. OK, here we go. So go run, and then it will tell me. So I don't need to pollute, excuse me, the term, but right, to pollute my Windows uh, instance with other tooling, right, like Go, Java, whatever, where I can actually put everything here inside uh, a distro and use this distro for my development, okay? And my windows stay clean. So to just prove, uh, let me exit from here. If I just do go, it will, I don't have go on windows. I have go on WSL2 and Visual Studio Code can connect, okay? Then uh, following, let's say the footsteps, uh, one of the most used uh, other, let's say, other than VS Code is IntelliJ um, from NetBeans. And this one actually also now has a WSL2 connector. So if you are uh, programming in Java, for example, if you use IntelliJ, which might be really the case nowadays, uh, then you will be able to have actually your GDK on, um, on uh, WSL and not on uh, Windows because sometimes apparently it's a bit more complicated to install it. Even nowadays, I don't know. I'm not a Java person, so don't quote me on that. But then here, again, the same if you run just a uh, uh, system get property of the OS name, it will return Linux. And you can see here which Java I'm using, which GDK, okay? So to prove it, I, um, 
I go here, and again, if I just do, sorry, Java, Java is not installed. Is again, one more time, installed on uh, the uh, on Oracle Linux actually this this one. So uh, if I go to Java Mentor, which is here, okay, you don't see because it's gray on gray, so it's quite difficult. But if I look here, I can see on my source that I have my main Java, which is this file here, and then I have it here. Okay. Again, I can here I can show how Go goes to one distro, for example, because I want to keep it clean, and then Java goes to another distro, right? So you can do some mix like that. Uh, I said five minutes. It's already gone, so I'm I'm almost done. Huh? Sorry, folks. Uh, then we have in the cloud native we have Docker, right? So that's why I say run, uh, why I'm looking at you. So the best way still nowadays, if you are a single developer, not working in a big company, or your company is not reaching $250 million a year of revenue, then Docker desktop is free for you. Okay? It's still free. It's still the first one that uh, did some integration with WSL. And it's still the best one, okay, around. Then from, again, I work for SUSE, right? So from my own company, there's Rancher Desktop uh, that came along. And since the 141 or even 130, I think, but anyway, since the latest one, now you will be able to have a Kubernetes cluster, which is K3S, our own Kubernetes cluster. And um, the Docker also is available for you. And if you want to run only Docker, okay, you can, All right? Uh, these two here will create actually uh, different distros as you could see here, double cell, dash L, dash V. So I have a rancher desktop data and a rancher desktop distribution. Okay, so data just runs once, and then whenever I launch rancher desktop, this will start running uh, directly. And the same goes for Docker desktop. Okay. Finally, if you are really into the container world, uh, we have something called Podman from Red Hat, uh, which belongs to IBM, but from Red Hat. And uh, there's a companion, it's called the Podman Companion, by the way, but uh, uh, this one also allows you to have a visual, okay, uh, graphics around the Podman command and it will be, uh, or it will allow you actually to run uh, containers, okay? And this one will also create um, uh, a distro. It, it, it was not listed because I didn't start it, but it will. Okay, that was all the tooling that I wanted to speak about. So finally, two last slides. If you want to know more about WSL, I strongly suggest you to have a look at the two books on the top from Aiden Barnes and from Stuart Leakes. So Aiden Barnes, uh, full disclosure, works at SUSE. Is my manager actually, but um, but we knew each other before, and he wrote the Pro Windows uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, which goes really in depth into uh, each chapter that I, I was explaining here. The book will cover it and even go a little bit deeper. Uh, Stuart Leakes created the tips, tricks, and techniques of WSL2, a really good book. If you know already a little bit about WSL2, you don't want to enter too much in depth of it, but you want to see like how best to use Visual, uh, Visual Studio Codes, uh, something that he calls like the Docker, um, the dev containers, okay? The book will cover it. Finally, if books are good, but you are more into let's say trainings, then this year actually uh, Stefan Rose, um, created a course all around uh, WSL2, okay? Again, you can find it on Udemy, 
uh, I will add the link and I will send it to uh, the commenter uh, persons. Then finally, um, if you want to know more about, let's say, Azure Cloud Native uh, and WSL2, okay, there's quite a lot of videos there, uh, is the Azuretar channel. Uh, if you are more into embedded systems, uh, it's Mateus uh, create a lot of documentation, a lot of videos. Most might be in Portuguese though. So uh, if you're not Portuguese speaker, then too bad. Uh, but I think he created some on um, on uh, on in English. And I think I saw go through something about like the Android and ADB and everything. And he will be definitely the person to uh, to contact and to connect with. Um, last year. Uh, my friend Siam Patak uh, on his channel did uh, what we call like the, the double cell to week. So every day there was like a, a video from beginners, uh, which is me, so you can bypass this one. And then you have other advanced uh, from other members of the community that are really knowledgeable about that. Uh, finally, shameless plug. Uh, if you want to read about double cell, I need to update it. Uh, been some while now, but uh, doublecell.dev, uh, there's already like quite a lot of uh, IDs and uh, uh, demos that I did uh, there. So feel free to go there. Okay, and that sums up. So uh, we are 11 minutes after the hour uh, based on the 20 minutes. So what I will do, because uh, I think there's still some Zoom bombers around, uh, I will just go around and uh, ta -ta -ta. Uh, ta -ta -ta. no worries. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so Ron, yeah. Okay, let me uh, lamp. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. So that's exactly what I said. So the question is like um, the IP addresses between uh, Windows and WSL2, especially when you have uh, running, um, let's say, uh, a server, right? Uh, like a web server in this case. So the IP that you will get is DHCP only, and it will remain as is until Microsoft does something about it. It uses the Hyper-V network stack, and unfortunately, this one, this virtual switch, we cannot uh, do anything about it, OK? The second point that is really, really important for you to know about networking, and it will go on records here, uh, so you can maybe refresh later on, but is that the ports, the, the network ports, are open from WSL to Windows. So you can use on Windows, if you open your browser, you can do a local host, uh, HTTP local host, and you will see what is running on WSL. The inverse automatically is not the case. You can do it manually with NetSH uh, command, NetSH interface port proxy. That's the, the command that you want. And then you can open ports on WSL from the ports that you have already opened on Windows, OK? But that's not automated two ways. There's port opening only one way, from WSL to uh, Windows. And the IP, if you want some kind of static IP or anything, you have to work with virtual IPs then on WSL and add the routes. Again, that will be a bit tricky, but add the routes on the Windows side, OK? Uh, then Emma, a couple questions. Uh, la la la. Okay. So sorry, I'm not knowledgeable about that. Oh, okay, okay. So it's again the ports and everything. Okay. I will have a look. So Emma, if you're still here, and if not, uh, all good. If you look at the the let's say the record, uh, drop me a message on Twitter, and I will help you with this one. Okay. Uh, just because of the time, sorry. Uh, so, Yahampath, yes, 
exactly. So you can, okay. You can target uh, from tools uh, into WSL. So you can use your tooling on Windows and target WSL. What you can do, but it's not recommended, is to keep your files, your project files, into the Windows side and then start, uh, let's say, compiling or debugging with WSL on your Windows Pass. This will eat performances issues. It's not impossible. It's just like it will be really, really slow. And it won't give you like a good experience. Um, so no, I, Rudo, so I don't know about uh, ADB. I, okay, I know about it, but I never used it. Um, with Windows 11 or the latest um, WSL uh, on the store, not the one that you install manually, but the store version. So that's why 11 for now. Um, Microsoft developed like the integration of USB. So now you can mount USB uh, devices, for example, uh, from WSL directly, okay? So you don't have like to pass go through Windows and so on, and which causes a lot of issues or in impossible to use ADB in the past. So now you will be able to connect normally directly your Android device directly into the WSL instance. Uh, so try it out again. You might be, uh, let's say, surprised that you should be able now to do something. Um, okay, I don't know anything about Node. Sorry for that. Uh, and then I think it's all good. Okay, so sorry for the delay. Sorry for the Zoom bombers. Uh, that was nine. That was my first time. So hey, why not? Only love for you. And uh, thank you. Let me stop sharing. And I hope that you learned something, or at least you can reference it in the future. And uh, really, uh, have a great continuation. Uh, hit me on Twitter if you have questions. And uh, really appreciate it that you came. Okay. Thank you all.